Good afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, having me back again. Um, I had an opportunity to talk last year and really enjoyed um, uh, bringing out my bag of ancient history and, and sharing it with you. And it worked well so, la so well last time I thought I'd bring out some more ancient history. Um, Bob Metcalf is a couple of years older than me. Uh, went to MIT as an undergraduate, uh, got a PhD from Harvard in, in computer science. Um, he originally wanted to do something on this thing called the ARPANET, but his proposal wasn't accepted, and he ended up uh, getting his doctorate in something called the Aloha uh, Radio Protocol, um, uh, developed by the University of Hawaii, and that has some significance uh, because he went on to, to Xerox Park. Um, you know, the Palo Alto Research Centre, where he uh, stumbled across this thing and invented, uh, in partnership with another guy, uh, Ethernet, uh, which, uh, as you're possibly aware, is a lot like the Aloha Protocol on a piece of wire. Um, he later founded 3Com and uh, later got attributed, um, uh, was attributed with, uh, coming out with Metcalfe's Law, although a few other people had said other things like it, but we'll get to that. Um, he's actually not my mate. Uh, I, haven't, I don't know him from a bar of soap, but what I did discover um, is that a number of the things on that list, specifically the invention of Ethernet and uh, the, the, the notion of Metcalfe's law, are things that I've s sort of latched onto as key knowledge chunks that I've carried around with me for a long time, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. So um, uh, Bob uh, co-invented Ethernet, and this is the famous napkin drawing of the uh, essential elements of Ethernet. Um, I suspect anyone under the age of about 40 will look at this and go, I don't understand anything there, that doesn't look my, like my Ethernet network. Um, but I can assure you the uh, original Ethernet was absolutely uh, like this. Uh, there was a big thick cable um, called Ethernet cable, there were terminators, there were taps, and uh, it was very much like this. And we'll come back to that, uh, that physical network in a moment. But the thing that I took away from Ethernet and that um, I've held dear for it ever is this. CSMACD. What does the CS stand for? Carrier Sense. What does the MA stand for? Multiple Access. And what's the CD stand for? Yeah, that's not bad from people who may have never seen a collision counter uh, on, on Ethernet for a lot of you. Uh, there will, of course, be those amongst you who, who spend lots of time worrying about collision detections. So why, is, why have we have that got background? Well, what, how does CSMA CD work? It's like a group of relatively polite people talking at a dinner table. Uh, you, well, if you want to say something, you wait patiently for a quiet break in the conversation. Uh, that's the carrier sense bit. Um, you then start talking, and if you hear that someone else is talking at the same time, you've detected a collision. So you back off a random period of time and, and restart the cycle. And of course, everyone has equal access to the conversation space. And so, hence, it's like a polite conversation. Now, briefly returning to, um, uh, I, I want to remember that thought, because that's important, but I just want to remind you of what this physical Ethernet looked like. Um, the yellow cable is that thing labeled Ethernet in the napkin diagram, and was about a centimetre thick. Okay, so when they said this is thick net, you know, it really meant it was thick. Um, and uh, the little yellow, uh, the, the orangey thing at the bottom here is, is, is a, a, a tapping tool. And so if you wanted to pr provide a connection in the very, very, very original Ethernet, you actually had to use this punch tool, drilling tool, to punch into the coaxial cable to get into the conductor. You would then put a clamp on it called a vampire tap. Pretty clever name, hang there's a big spike and sticks in there anyway. Um, and that way you would then connect that uh, to a, a transceiver and then that would then have an AUI cable connected to a NIC. It was kind of ridiculous, but um, it was very cool at the time. Uh, remember when this Ethernet LAN technology came out, most of us, you had dumb terminals connected through great big dumb terminal switches, like the Micon brand terminal switches. Yeah, a couple of nodding heads. Um, so this, this LAN stuff was pretty cool, but um, the technology at, at that time seemed uh, wonderful, but looking back at it now, uh, you <laughs> struggle to find pictures of it on the internet. Um, so ThinkNet was replaced by a thinner net, which was still pretty ugly. There are some thin net bits and pieces there, and subsequently replaced by um, being able to carry these Ethernet signals over a uh, twisted pair. And uh, that led to the idea of a hub uh, and repeaters. But we remember here that this was one piece of cable that was shared by everybody. And this is where the, the first key learning comes in. The, there were a whole bunch of rules about how you could put the original Ethernet together. And so when I keep saying the word original, 
I don't mean before them new funky things called switches or bridges were widely used. So this is a really long time ago, right? So there were all these rules about how many repeaters you could have, um, the four repeater rule, the, the five, four, three rule, you know, no more than five network segments with four repeaters, no more than three of them can actually have end users on them, um, uh, and, and all of that. And the question is why? Why were those funny requirements on there? Well, the answer is the collision detect piece. Okay, you, you, can't, you couldn't make the cable infinitely long because the signal would degrade, so it has to be sufficiently not long that the signal doesn't degrade, but more importantly, you had to make sure there was enough time, real elapsed wall clock time, to defect, detect the collision, or otherwise the conversation becomes completely hopeless. You know, back to the conversation analogy, right? So th there was a finite time you had to apply to the Ethernet protocol to say, look, if I haven't got a collision by now, it's never going to happen, or if has one, one occurred, I can respond appropriately. So on that first slide, um, I've already grabbed, a, clearly grabbed a few PowerPoint slides off the internet. You know, there's an actual round trip time piece here. And so this was my first key learning that uh, Bob Getmark Metcalf gave to me through the Ethernet protocol is that any time embrace protocol is doomed to failure. Um, or any assumption about delay ends up to being doomed to failure because this didn't scale. If you want to make a really big Ethernet, it doesn't work. You literally can't go too far because you've got to have this time constraint. And so we invented these things called bridges, broken into segments, and, and other things happened. Um, for those that are really interested and are looking for a show of hands here, we can talk a bit more about timer-based protocols uh, and that would dominate uh, the conversation with Dendi dominated about the local access transport protocol or LAT, the digital invented. Uh, also a timer-based protocol, also an absolute nightmare to debug. But uh, Tim's talk just now about network throughput is also related to this, is anything that relies on the assumption to delay breaks badly. So wall clock time is a dangerous thing to have in network protocols. First key learning. Um, for those keeping notes, the key learnings are the big thing, things in big orange letters. So there's some more of those coming. So collision detect, that was the first learning out of uh, Ethernet. The second thing was, you know, a little bit of a reminder here, when we said multiple access, we mean it's shared media. Okay, there's a reason why we draw Ethernets like, we used to draw Ethernets like this. Everyone had access to the cable. Now what this actually means is that it could be exactly one conversation happening at any given instant. One one-way conversation happening at any given instant. So if the two devices down in the bottom here wanted to talk, well, they had to do the whole CSMACD thing and wait until the cable went quiet and, and try and, and so on, so on, so on. So even though you had 10 megabits, it was shared and you all took it in a randomly determined uh, turns to gain access to that. So clearly a constraint. So that, that ability to move forward and, and go faster uh, could be fixed by just changing the clock rate. We can go from 10 meg ethernet to 100 meg ethernet. And we did do that. And you could buy 100 meter hubs, 100 meg hubs, 100 meter, 100 megabit hubs at some stage. But what ended up happening is just going faster, going from 10, meter, 10 meg shared hub to 100 meg shared hub wasn't enough. What happened is that a whole bunch of the IT industry, including me, spent a lot of time convincing you all that you need to move to switching, okay? And the IT industry was right. And why was the IT industry right? Why are switches cooler than hubs? Multiple conversations, right? You can now have two or more conversations or data paths happening simultaneously. So a 10 meg switch, you know, the original Kalpana switches, may they rest in peace, um, were exactly that. They enabled multiple conversations to happen at the same time. We're not, we are no longer using a shared media segment to actually do the conversations. So that's the, the, the key learning. Shared was very bad, not better, way better than nothing, but parallel was much better. Now the amusing thing about this is we still do a lot of shared stuff. And there are a lot of shared protocols out there in the world, and most of them are wireless. So if you're in a wireless network, you know, a situation where you're using wireless, and you go, oh, it works crap. All of you are clever people and go, someone stuffed up the RF engineering. 
you won't go, oh, the backhaul's bad or um, the Ethernet switches that those access points on are bad because almost all of us know it's the shared segment that's going to be the problem. Okay, and it's the same as the conversation room analogy. Really, there can only work, be one person speaking. If we all tried to speak at once, it won't work. There's only a certain amount of frequency at 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz that you can speak in, and all you network devices have to be able to fit into that and take your turns you are using some combination of time division multiplexing or frequency division multiplexing. So it's shared. Oh, by the way, it turns out it's not just wireless segments that have this characteristic of being shared. Anything in the HFC or DOCSIS world is shared because it's a shared coaxial cable. Uh, GPON, the return signal on, on GPON is, is, all, uh, is all shared as well. So there's plenty of sharing going out there and some of it could be bad. Um, Tim also talked about um, how we can use uh, technologies to go faster on, on the backbone, uh, particularly for long haul. Um, and in, the, in a perfect world, we have a dedicated connection from everywhere to everyone else. Everywhere else, that's not going to happen on individual segments. Um, and things like DWM are an advanced way of getting sort of dedicated, but it's really more just parallel type performance. So that was the other key learning. You know, look carefully at your individual segments. Sure, we're always going to see congestion where, you know, multiple things come together, but on individual network segments, uh, that learning around, well, how much, how many speakers can consume this bandwidth at any given instant and, and how is it shared ends up being a, a lifelong learning um, and enables us and me and, and all of you to say things like, oh, well, if the wireless network's slow, it's probably because the RS crap, not the backhaul. But. So changing gears, the second thing uh, I said uh, I learned out of, uh, from Metcalf uh, was not only um, uh, the invention of Ethernet and some of these interesting discoveries in my knowledge life, which you may all know and discovered in other ways, but was, was Ethernet that uh, reminded uh, me of all this, is, is Metcalfe's law. So Metcalfe's law says the effect of a telecommunications network is proportional to the square of the number of connected users of the system. It kind of makes sense, right? And if you've got two things, well, now we can talk to each other, but if I could talk to five other, four other things, or, or a dozen other things, then you know, it's clearly a lot more valuable because everyone can now speak to everyone. So there's obviously some value in increasing the number of interconnections in a network. And certainly, um, you know, this, is, this came out of the, the middle 1980s um, and you know, was used extensively in the 1990s for almost every single crazy startup who would say, look, uh, you know, as soon as we get more users on the internet, you know, we'll have a business case and the internet bubble was driven by any number of people saying, well, there's just going to be tens of thousands or millions of people coming along to our system and the more people we have, uh, the better it will be. And, uh, well, it turned out not to be completely true uh, in the case of the internet bubble and a lot of those com companies, but it also turns out not to be a perfect model. So there are a bunch of problems with Metcalfe's laws. In fact, if you Google Metcalfe's law, which I'm sure all of you will do, which I did earlier this week, um, this turns out to be quite a lot of interesting reading around why it's horribly broken. Um, and so there's a bunch of reasons, and I'll let you Google away. But I, I guess the two that I find interesting uh, are the first that it's pretty obvious that when you talk about connected users, uh, if we thought, think about all the connections we have on our campus networks or on the internet, not all the connected users are the same. There's a bit of a difference between your iPhone's connectivity here in this room and the servers Tim was talking about earlier throwing 37 gigabits of traffic so as TCP's limited to a one gigabyte, wi gigabyte window size? Gigabyte or gig gigabyte window size? Um, a dreadful oversight from the inventors of TCP. Um, so, you know, not all, or not all pigs are equal, right? Not all connected users are the same. Uh, and the second thing with Metcalfe's law um, that uh, often happens is it's not so much the effect of the network, but the value of the network is somehow um, proportional to the square of the number of endpoints. And I, I, don't, I don't think that holds true, and I'll try and explain why. So the first thing is the, the, that previous picture I showed you of the network, well, what were the end devices in that picture? The, the 4, 25, 144 thing. Telephones, right. And what do we know about telephones? They are incredibly dumb devices. Old, old is another word, but they're incredibly dumb devices. 
all the smarts in a phone network is at the telephone switch. Right? There's nothing clever about the endpoint at all. The endpoint can't function at all without the smarts in the middle. Certainly can't place calls without the thing in the middle. The brain, that's what the funny pink blob is. Um, you have to do, make do with what you can do in terms of icons. The network is the service. The network is the phone system. All the smarts are in there somewhere, usually in a very large box, that are, in this case, a, a phone talker. So let's con contrast that with a typical IP network. Uh, let's find one, one good example I know is called the internet. So the internet is an interconnection between a bunch of really clever devices. Even your iPhone is incredibly clever. Uh, one of the conversations I was having with Jeff Houston, uh, when he was, you know, giving one of his sermons, as most of the conversations you have with Jeff are, more like sermons. Um, he was talking about you know, how uh, badly behaved devices were and how weird some behaviours were. And did you know that when an iPhone is uh, both connected to 3G, 4G and Wi-Fi, it will try and act get two uh, active connections running on both and play them off against each other in terms of performance. So you actually have connections happening at you know, both times and suddenly realise that they're very clever and intelligent devices. And then, of course, you know, back to my analogy around um, there are not all connections are equal. There are things like uh, dumb endpoints, like a phone or a browser, and there are very complicated endpoints, like a supercomputer or, or uh, a, an instrument. So what you end up in that scenario is that it's not the network itself that's actually providing the goodness. It's the things at the end. It's the web servers, it's the instruments, it's the, um, the content servers, the content caches. It's the things at the edge that are cool, not the network itself. The network's just dumb, which, which of course was a feature of the original design of the ARPANET. You know, bits of it could be blown up or taken away and it would soldier on. You actually didn't need the network to keep going. Now, the other obvious proof point is uh, that uh, some of these particular nodes might be particularly important and in fact might contribute a huge amount to the value of the network. Okay, so imagine the, the big grey uh, brain or endpoint is now Facebook. Okay, I, I know it's multiple endpoints, I know there's many, multiple routes to it, work with me on this. So here's Facebook on the network, clearly it's got more value, you could lose one of the other pink brains on the uh, right hand diagram and it would be no big deal, it would still be a useful network, but if you lost the grey brain, all of Facebook, then the value of that connected system goes down a lot. Well, assuming you value Facebook, but anyway, that's a longer conversation. So, a lot of problems with the network law and, and you know, are really fundamentally linked to this. Is the network the service, or is, is the value in the fact that the network's the service, or is the value in the interconnection of the services? Now, one way of uh, solving any problem is to um, uh, abstract it. And another one is to constrain the problem. So Sarnoff, a um, uh, guy of Russian extraction, uh, ended up in the broadcasting industry uh, and had a lot to do with uh, uh, the NBC and the original broadcast uh, television system in the United States, came up with a law um, and which is the value of a broadcast network. It's a proportional number of viewers. So I've constrained the problem. We're just talking about somebody who sends information out, obviously the number of people who receive it. Um, increase its value. So maybe the network value is simply the number of people who can be reached in a broadcast service. But we know that the, the, the richness of the internet and the richness of the service is much greater than that. Uh, so I'd suggest that, you know, out of Metcalfe's law, what I take away is the value of the network is actually a function of its connected services. It's what we interconnect that makes it special. It's not actually the network itself. Now, that doesn't mean you should all run away and, and, and go and find some other way of doing your network connectivity, because it's the community that Arnet and the worldwide NRENs create that enables the connection of the services that are relevant to our organisations. So, so even though I'm sort of trying to say, the network doesn't matter, the network doesn't matter because it is crucial, is fundamental in enabling access to those services and actually accessing those unique services that are important to our community. So I hope those uh, three uh, uh, wise old sayings for someone who's feeling increasingly old um, are a little bit useful. Um, I'd uh, be enthusiastic about coming back next year to talk about uh, the local area transport protocol, LAT. Um, I'd even like to talk about token ring, although that won't be a positive conversation. Um, or any of the other technologies I've uh, encountered in my, in my time. 
Uh, but hopefully they've been useful and if you've got any comments or uh, experiences you'd like to share about thick ethernet, uh, please do share them with me. Thanks very much.